Tēnā koutou i te whanau, ko te kahoro a hau. Um, just like to thank you all for uh, tuning in for the first episode of what I'm going to be calling Half-Cast History. The reason why I chose that name is because I'm a half-cast basically, and all I've seen in this country is either a whitewashed version of history or a brownwashed version of history. And basically, they don't marry up, um, sorry, they don't mouldy up, <laughs> or um, basically what we're trying to do here is, is look to the future of what this country should look like. So today in the first history lesson, um, we're talking about uh, how constitutionally this country has come about. Um, and that's through the document called He Waka Putanga, which I know is causing quite a stir around the country. Um, there's nothing secret about it. Um, it's easy enough to Google. Um, the government um, pushed this narrative, so, you know, in honesty, they know about it, so it's nothing special. Um, so, but what is special are the various stories that have um, come up about Hiwaka Putanga and its inception, basically. And what I want to do today is, is show, uh, I guess, three different versions of what I've come across with the inception of Hiwaka Putanga. And, and, you know, kind of really trying to figure out what's going on with this psychological operation why um, the country is so confused um, in its constitutional history um, and where to from here basically you know we have to study the past to look why uh, look at the future so that we don't make the same mistakes but it's hard to when our, f our history is so blanketed in bullshit and lies basically <coughs> so um, Firstly, I want to talk about um, the government's um, history, I suppose, and what they're trying to push at the moment. Um, because when I was down in Wellington um, for the first Huck of the Beehive, um, and the first Huck of the Beehive was all about spreading the word of Hewaka Putanga and what it was all about. And um, when I was down there, I had no idea, but the government had created a uh, exhibition at the local Na National Archive no, not, sorry, not the National Archive, the National Library down there, called the Hetohu Exhibition, which um, is talking about the, the three documents, um, basically. Uh, you can easily Google Hetohu, and they give you enough information about their narrative, I suppose, um, and then also the links to the Ta'ara website here, which, uh, which I'm just going to be bringing up here. Firstly, I wanted to show this ship here. This is the HMS Gothic, I believe, and it's Her Majesty's ship. Um, and I just wanted to bring this up because of the little flag here at the bow of the ship. Bow? Stern. Stern. Ugh. Sorry. Sorry, ship people. At the front of the boat is this flag here. And, um,. Because the flag's important, apparently, and you know, hopefully by the end of all of these episodes, we can figure out if this flag is going to be important to us for the future. Anyway, moving on. This is the Ta'ara website, this is the government um, rhetoric, um, and it gives you a brief background to the declaration. They call it the Declaration, but it's not actually a Declaration of Independence. It's a Proclamation of Independence, because while we were never under anything before, so we don't have to declare that we're independent. America had to declare their independence from Britain, because Britain had power over the states at that time. <coughs> <coughs> And so in New Zealand, we never ne needed to declare our independence because we weren't under the British at this point anyway. So this is wrong. 
anybody who is out there calling it the Declaration of Independence is wrong. Um, that's including you, the Māori government, also known as Waka Meninga Ki Maniapoto, also known as Georgie Job, and all you fellas, stop calling it the Declaration of Independence because it's wrong. Anyway, moving forward, blah, 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 appointment of British resident, blah, blah, blah. This is here what I want to talk about. New Zealand owned ships were in danger of being seized as they did not fly a national flag. In 1830, the Sir George Murray, a ship part owned by Chiefs Patuone and Taunui, was seized in Sydney for not having a national flag. Fuck if I've never heard so much bullshit in my life. 1. New Zealand ships have been trading in Sydney for 50 years prior to this. 50 years at least. So that's bullshit. Sir George Murray may have been part owned by the Chiefs. We can't find any uh, legal documentation that has them, their names in there. I believe that they were the ones that gave over the timber to build these ships in Horeke, but I don't think they owned them, especially the Sir George Murray. We're talking. Uh, something like a, a 300 ton bark. I mean, we're talking a ship that's the same size as the Endeavour. This is a huge ship. I'm not saying that Mary's never owned or had any, you know, right to be into these ships or anything, but what I'm saying is that, well, what, what I'm saying is that a ship part owned by Chiefs Patawana and Taunui. Now, I know for a fact that it was part owned by um, Thomas uh, Raines, um, who was a missionary. Missionaries aren't meant to own that, you know, aren't meant to be that economically minded, but hey, that's what happened in New Zealand. So, <coughs> there's another bit of bullshit. Well, it was part owned by Parker. And the main bullshit is, was seized in Sydney for not having a national flag. As I say, we've been trading in, um, in, um, in Australia for 50 years prior. Walkers were going over, ships were going over, whalers were going over. New Zealand had already created enough ship, you know, there'd been a few ships built in New Zealand by that time. So that's bullshit. And that's, so that's the whitewashed version. Here is a very good research, I mean, um, resource. And this is called patuwane.com. And it's got a lot of uh, information about Patawane. Patawane is an interesting character, um, mainly because um, he was there when Cook arrived and he tasted the salted pork from the ship. And he was also there signing the Treaty of Waitangi. So, Here's a man who basically saw the whole um, colonization of it all. Uh, his brother, Tamati Wakanene. Now, these guys fought on the side of the British when Honeheke started chopping down um, flagpoles. Um, these guys fought with the British against their, 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 um, their whanau. Um, where are we here? Do, 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 do. Sorry, I should have highlighted this part. Can you actually highlight in the browser? I'm not sure. Um, but it's uh, what, is, what I'm pointing at here. Oh, here we go. Man, sorry guys. Um, definitely interesting read, all of this. I just can't remember exactly where I had seen the Sir George Murray. It's basically saying the same thing as the other, um, the, the whitewashed version, to be honest, uplifting these chiefs, um, Patawane, for instance, who is um, renowned as being a great friend to the Crown, ended up dying in Takapuna 
in um, Auckland there. He owned most of the land between um, uh, Devonport and um, most likely Campbell's Bay, probably all the way to Milford, to be honest. And um, his wife, w w who was very young, um, his sixth wife or something, I mean, by this, he died at 106. His wife was, was very young, and she sold all that land to the Crown, something like 10,000 acres of North Shore Prime beachfront property. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, did she have mana whenua to be able to do that? basically. You know, wonder Patawane is remembered on his grave in Devonport um, at the Methodist Church, I believe there, as being a great and dear friend to the colony of New Zealand. Um, I don't know why they use this whakatauki here. Interesting. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to try and find that in there, because this here is the document that I want to bring to light. Because this is the, um, the best document that I've found about the history of this corridor. Sorry cuz I'm in the middle of something. And that is the George Murray, the Sir George Murray. Interestingly here, they put a photo of John Key next to John Busby. James Busby, sorry. Very interesting. And um, interesting um, title. Anyway, th this, this document is, is, you know, this is where we like our our history going, you know, referenced, you know, f exactly to the point of things, you know. Um, we're talking about Patawane. Um, she was immediately empowered and so began the history of the New Zealand flag. She sat there for quite some time, which didn't sit well with two prominent Māori chieftains on board, Patawane and Taunui. This led James Busby to assemble 25 rangatira at his farm to choose our first flag. Bullshit. Big time bullshits. Now let us examine this beginning. Because the Sir George Murray was a Kiwi trading ship and it was built in Tohoreke in the upper reaches of the Hokianga. And when it first arrived in Sydney on 18th of November 1830, it was owned by Thomas Rain, a British subject and merchant living in New South Wales who also owned the Hokianga shipyard where it was built. More correctly, this 392-ton bark was not a British-built ship and was therefore classified as foreign. The Sir George Murray was not immediately impounded for not flying a flag. Its two-week detainment in Neutral Bay was most likely occasioned by Rain's personal bankruptcy, which afforded the trustees of his estate time to make arrangements to liquidate his assets, including auctioning the Sir George Murray, its duty-free cargo of flax and timber, and the shipyard at Te Horeke. So, this paints a much more logical picture of capitalist dealings, basically, and how debt and that kind of thing can get you into the shit and basically cover up, um, cover up the true histories. Um, I like this history. I feel like it's true. I feel like it's more, um, more correct. So, unfortunately for the panel, now I believe those are the people who were picking the flag, the Sir George Murray incident is not the beginning of the New Zealand flag's history, but more like the end of the road for a New South Wales merchant. In short, the Sir George Murray was not seized for breaching British navigation law, but was auctioned, along with its duty-free cargo in the Hokianga shipyard on the 25th of January 1831 by the trustees of the Thomas Rain estate because, in Rain's own words, his reduced circumstances had forced him to suspend his payments in 1829. Furthermore, had the Sir George Murray had been seized under British navigation and customs law 
and sold by agents of the colonial government, such an action would have necessitated the carrying out of strict formal procedures and a hearing in the Court of Record or Vice Admiralty, all of which would have taken many months, longer than the two months it took from the time of its arrival to being put up to the hammer and knocked down by Mr Simmons for £1,300. Thank you, Mr. Bevan, who wrote this, because this is great, and he's not wrong, because I've been trying to do research on Sir George Murray, and it's like a ghost ship, basically, because it was named something different after it was sold here in Sydney, when it got put under the, um, the debtor's hammer. So, I will stick by this, um this history until someone can tell me otherwise. Um, another bit of bullshit is, and I suppose this is what they're trying to, to cover up, Busby never petitioned to the king for a flag. Busby had nothing to do with any of it. Thirteen chiefs got together in the Kitty Kitty area and um, scribed a letter in perfect English. Maybe not perfect, but they did a good job. Asking the king for protection because of the French. Now, that's probably going to be a topic of my, my next um, half-cast history. Because they're not wrong but what diplomatic what global events were happening at the time for Māori to be fed anti-French rhetoric by the missionaries now yes the Anglican Church was interesting and the missionaries that they brought here to New Zealand played a very big part in taking land well, getting gifted land and then commercialising it and then selling it on. Um, so what were these missionaries up to here? Who was the Church Missionary Society? Who were its members? What were their elite ties? And what areas around the country did these missionaries have um, huge influence this is all going to be in my next episode of Half Cast History. I really hope that you enjoy this first um, episode, um, as controversial as it is, but I really needed to show um, what I believe is the true history of this country, and it's a corporate history, and that's what we need to figure out here. Is he Wakaputanga a cultural document or is it a corporate document? Is it a living document or is it tied into his, is it tied into the corpse regime? Does the Treaty of Waitangi actually offer us any protection? Does the Treaty of Waitangi actually offer British subjects protection? And does the Treaty of Waitangi protect us? with the Bill of Rights. These are all questions that we hope to get to the bottom of um, in Half Cast History so that we can marry up our cultures and move forward into a beautiful future. I hope you all had a wonderful time watching. Um, my name's Takahoroa. Um, you may also know me as Cory Bond. But here we go. Let's go. Let's fuck up their history. Let's put it onto our hands. Namahi, everybody. Much love.